This is the Sunday stream opening song because the other song is copyrighted. La 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 Oh look, here comes Dog Cat Fox! Hi, Scott! Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday stream. The stream I do on Sundays, because Sunday is the day to stream on Sundays. Hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. Beautiful Sunday morning. Speaking of singing, before I begin anything else, uh, I uh, made an error in my previous broadcast on the Ted Excellent Show. Uh, as I was wrapping up the show, unbeknownst to me, there was a request in the chat from longtime viewer George Mason that I sing to his son for his birthday. And I didn't see it until just as I was hitting the button to close out the broadcast. So... Uh, I don't know if George is watching. I don't know if he'll see this in the near future, but on the off chance anybody else runs into him in another chat or sees him elsewhere, uh, I'm happy to do it again for him, but just in case, I'm going to do it now. So, uh, James, I hope you had a good birthday. Granted that it's already happened. I'm going to assume so. And uh, your father asked me uh, to uh, sing for you once again, and so here we go. And a one. And a two. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear James! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, James. Hope you had a good one. Hope you're doing well. And, uh... Yeah. Okay. My brain, my, my brain left me for a second there. I guess that last octave just kind of blew away my brain cells. Uh, who's joining me today on this beautiful Sunday morning? Uh, Random American. Good morning. Mike Savage, Dax Orion, uh, Lord of Long Requests of Name Stuffs. There you go. Brittany Holland, Noah Essential, Old Guy Gamer. Uh, who else is here? Kiever Dam, of course. Oh, and Kiever Dam sent the fundraisers, which I will now post to the top of the chat box. Get to those momentarily. Thank you, Kiever Dam. Uh, Seftis Wolf, good morning. Who else is here? Somnamnial Nation, A2P. Uh, Mike Savage, Bridget, 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 Red Fawn, Spoonie the Rebel, Advocatus Diaboli, JB, a Scanner Daftly, Shadow Claw, Ost Sam, and is that everybody? Uh, that is everybody that I see. If I missed you, if you're lurking, if you're in the future, good morning. And uh, Keeverdam, thank you. I mean, first off, as always, thank you for uh, reminding slash providing the fundraiser links uh, for us, of course. And thank you so much for your generosity. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody, be sure to give Keeverdam a thank you in the chat for everything that she does for the channel. Uh, and uh but speaking of the fundraisers, the top of the chat box, you'll find fundraisers for our friends Moonshock, uh, Angry Illinoisian, and Tracy, a friend of uh, Twisted Skipster. Um, Moonshock and Angry Illinoisian had some uh, medical catastrophes, and uh, any uh, money you could send their way would be greatly appreciated. Tracy is just trying to keep the lights on, so if you can send a couple of bucks her way, that would be as well appreciated. And if you can't donate, that's perfectly fine, but if you can, share those links out on social media that would be wonderfully helpful. So thank you so much. All right. Well, with all of that as preamble, what's on topic for today? Well, I realize that about maybe a little more or a little less than a year ago, uh, I did a stream regarding prison abolition. And prison abolition and restorative justice and things like that have been a interest, an interest of mine for many years now. You may have seen a few videos I've done on the subject. And it occurred to me, golly, what is the current thinking on prison abolition in the current year. And so I decided to gather up a couple of articles, uh, some far longer than others. I think the first one I have up here is probably, probably the longest. Uh, that's what she said. And I thought I'd take a look and see uh, what are the arguments, what are the rationales uh, for getting rid of prisons? Because the concept alone to me makes very little sense. Um, mitigating or having some kind of, you know, uh, aversion programs rather than incarceration, it would all really depend on the context of what we're talking about. But abolishing them, like actual, the definition of the word abolishing them, 
that one seems a bridge too far to me, but we'll find out as we go. So with that, let me begin with this one from Atmos Earth, uh, which I guess is more of a environmental publication, but uh, and that does fit figure into this article. But specifically, imagining a world without prisons for the front line. Two prison abolitionists discuss the environmental harm of prisons and one idea for Rikers Island in New York City. All right. Most climate movements target fossil fuel companies, banks, and governments. But there's another set of institutions, systems, and structures that one grassroots movement in particular is focusing on. Prisons. I don't think it's the only grassroots movement, but all the same. Fight toxic prisons. <laughs> all right. Works at the intersection of environmental justice and prison abolition. Oh, that's... That has to be a very bizarre dimension. A worldview that seeks to dismantle all forms of incarceration by getting rid of police, immigration detention centers, juvenile detention, and other similar structures. Uh-huh. Well, hmm. Get my water there for a second. Uh, that's, uh, th that is a bold goal or set of goals. Getting rid of police. All right. Abolitionists aim to reduce and prevent harm before it happens, rather than wait for the harm and punish an individual afterward. Uh, yeah, it's called deterrence. And how do you deter crime in a civilized society? By having consequences hanging over your head for even enacting such things. That's the best you can do, really. But... Okay. Oh, Derek LaRue. Derek LaRue, good morning. And thank you, as always. Thank you so much for your generosity and support. I uh, really do appreciate it. Um, by the way, so uh, short story here. Uh, my mother, uh, most wonderful person I know, uh, she sent my sister and I an email the other day that said, um, I don't know if you've already bought me anything for Mother's Day, but uh, instead of buying me something, I'd rather you donate to a cause that helps people. Um, and so uh, on my on my mother's request, uh, I made a donation to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society just the other day, uh, in part primarily because of that, but also in part to your guys' uh, overall audience, donors to the fundraisers and to myself, your generosity. Uh, when I can, I do my best to donate to organizations that I think uh, help people, uh, even if my mother's not asking me to. I don't often advertise such. I don't really go that way unless I'm trying to encourage others to do so as well. So um, for Mother's Day, uh, you may consider, instead of getting mom a gift, you might donate somewhere in her name. Uh, that might be a good way to go. So whether it's the Leukemia Lymphoma Society or some other charitable organization, uh, that's what I'd encourage you to think about, at least. So that all being said, again, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Kiefer Dam, and everybody for your generosity. Uh, moving on here. Uh, Abolit as I say, I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, okay. Abolitionists aim to reduce and prevent harm before it happens rather than wait for the harm and punish an individual afterwards. Alongside individual harm, they also focus on systemic harms caused by corporations, governments, and structures that lead to marginalization and oppression. For abolitionists, policing and inc incarceration cause harm, not solve it. Uh -huh. This ideological underpinning also means that abolitionists want to dismantle racial capitalism. Uh, racial capitalism. You might want to look at the racial identitarians out there right now selling books on the subject, but that aside. The exploitation of black and brown people to create profit for the predominantly white. Predominantly? Uh-huh. Wealthy people at the top of the socioeconomic hierarchy. That's a weird way to phrase that. You mean and wealthy people? So Jeff Bezos, basically. Uh, fight toxic prisons intersectional approach is an obvious one. Black, indigenous, Latin. What? Latin. Is that? I, I don't know that I've seen that before. I was expecting Latinx or Latino. Latin is that a new is that a new attempt at at uh, emasculating Latino? Okay, Muslim, queer, disabled, and other marginalized folks 
are overrepresented at every level of the criminal criminal legal system. Oh, this phrase. Yeah, they've been really pushing this one for a few years now. Instead of calling it the criminal justice system, they call it the criminal legal system because there is no justice in our system and the, and the system itself is criminally legal or something. They're trying really hard to push this. Uh, it still doesn't quite roll off the tongue the same, but they're, they're doing their best. Uh, these same communities are first and worst impacted by the climate crisis. Um, the climate discriminates on the basis of race and or your ability. Okay. Both in its causes and its consequences, despite being the least responsible for it. Uh, humans are, it, if there is climate change, as has been described to me, humans are responsible for it. It doesn't really matter what you look like or how well you can operate your limbs. Okay. Prisons carry physical environmental impacts. They emit toxic chemicals. Uh-huh. Pollute nearby air and water and often sit in, sorry, sit on or near toxic waste. How often is often? I don't know. Even where other buildings would not be considered, states welcome prisons because they don't value the health and well-being of people who are incarcerated or the communities nearby. All right. Quote, during the prison boom from 1970 to 2000, prisons were more likely to be built in densely populated towns with prior proximate prison. With prior proximate prison. You mean with a prior proximate prison? Oh boy, okay. With prior proximate prison with a higher than average percentages of poverty. With a higher than average percentages. Singular to plural in the same... Okay, sorry guys, it's my brain. I don't know what to tell you. With a higher than average percentages of poverty, black people, and Hispanic people, reads a 2010 paper on prison locations. A 2010 paper? Would you like to cite that paper? Was it somebody's college essay? Okay. Nowhere exemplifies this more than the Rikers Island Jail in New York City, with an average daily population of over 5,500, most of whom are still awaiting trial. Rikers has become globally known for its extreme violence and brutality. Lesser known are the jail's environmental implications. Rikers Island, on which the jail sits, is made of landfill, much of which is coal ash, a byproduct of coal mining that is full of harmful toxins. Moored in the East River, Rikers sits at a bay in between Queens and, South, and the South Bronx, near neighborhoods predominantly home to Black and Latin, Latin families who, are, who already face pollution from nearby noxious power plants and old wastewater treatment plants. Yes, I'm sure there are no white people anywhere near there that are living within the same conditions as described, I'm sure. Uh, one Bronx neighborhood that overlooks Rikers has been named Asthma Alley for its incredibly high rates of air pollution. Its population is 96% Latin and Black. Latin, okay. A decades-long courageous battle by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, their families, loved ones, activists, legislators, and allies led to a groundbreaking piece of legislation in 2019, slating Rikers for closure by 2027. This is a tremendous success for those who had fought for so long, but it left one crucial question unanswered. What to do with the land that remained? What land? It's, it's, it's landfill. It's poisonous, coal ash, toxic asthma-inducing landfill. All right. An answer emerged, as all great answers do, collaboratively among the communities most impacted. The proposed project, named Renewable Rikers, hopes to see cages replaced with green energy sources and barbed wire pulled out to make way for safe waste facilities. So you're going on a, a piece of toxic real estate built on toxic chemicals, you're going to put green energy resources and safe waste facilities. So you're still going, so, so are you going to put waste onto a toxic dump and powering green energy near communities most impacted by toxic runoff? 
Okay, at the moment, this is only an idea. Why am I not surprised? The law doesn't lay out a specific plan for Rikers, only that in closing it, the state would open four borough-based jails. Oh, so close one, open four. <laughs> okay. In other words, the plan to close Rikers is also a plan to build new jails in New York City. Okay. So far, plans to close the jail have been constantly delayed, leading even the city's mayoral administration to question whether the plans will be complete by 2027. Campaigners have been urging the city to act faster and adhere to its own timeline. Well, let me guess. I bet there's a whole bunch of places within the city itself that aren't jazzed about the idea of building prisons right next to where they live, which is why you have the prison out on an island away from everyone. But... Okay. Still, the vision put forth in Renewable Rikers allows New Yorkers to reimagine what's possible. Uh-huh. The plan takes much of fight toxic prisons theory and puts it into practice. How? When are the police getting abolished? When are the juvenile detention centers getting abolished? When are the immigration detention centers getting abolished? Uh, below, Andrea Johnson, the architect for Renewable Rikers, speaks with Jordan martinez Mazurik from Fight Toxic Prisons about the similarities and tensions between the sustainable landscape design industry and grassroots abolition organizing. Yeah, I've looked at this before, uh, design and restorative justice or design and abolition before, uh, architects and so on trying to design buildings for healing centers or community justice centers and things like that. Uh, but you're gonna be tearing down a prison. All right. Uh, this goes on for a bit. Uh, I, I will read a few passages and we'll see if it keeps my interest. If not, we'll move on to another article. But uh, before I do that, over in the chat, uh, those ain't real, dude, says prisoners are going to be green energy source. I'm for that. Yeah, no, not exactly. Uh, Marta is watching YouTube. Well, Marta's watching Scribelite. Hi, Marta. Uh, let's see. Uh, old guy gamer, the left keeps using this green word like they're pushing Soylent Green. Yeah, it's it's a buzzword. It's it's you know it's it's shorthand for it's good. Trust me. You look into the details of some of these proposals though, and it's like, how is that supposed to work? I don't know. A two P Harry Potter and the Alley of Asthma. I mean, it might be a side quest in Hogwarts. Uh, what's it called? Har Hogwarts Academy or whatever that video game is. I don't know. I'm not much of a gamer. All right. Jordan Martinez Mazurik. How does the project's environmental justice scope interface with the design side of things? What's been your experience working with the local community to really get that going? Environmental justice scope interface. <laughs> Uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Andrea Johnson. Rikers is situated at the nexus of all this noxish, noxious infrastructure. So the plan has three major proposals in terms of green infrastructure. There are four peaker power plants, which are activated at times of peak energy usage within a mile and a half radius of the island. They emit highly toxic gases. Because Rikers Island is over 400 acres, it really offers an opportunity to develop energy storage to contribute to phasing out those plants. Where does the energy come from? I mean, if you're just going to populate the island with big giant batteries or capacitors or something, the, the energy has to come from somewhere. You're not talking about creating power generation plants, right? Okay, the Peak Coalition has been organizing for many years to close these plants, and some of the organizations in our coalition also belong to that as well. These campaigns have intersecting ambitions. Okay, well, again... Where is the energy going to come from? If you're developing energy storage to contribute to phasing out those plants. Okay, well, that storage is going to have to be, well, refreshed by a power generation system. Where is that going to come from if you shut down power plants? I don't know. Uh, there are also three wastewater treatment plants that surround the island and contribute to disproportionate combined sewer overflows in the East River. Part of Renewable Rikers' goal is to consolidate these into one larger plant on the island. How is that going to reduce sewer overflow? 
Okay. Um, the last infra okay, the last infrastructure proposal is composting and organic waste processing. Rikers sits at the confluence of three marine waste transfer stations. We're not advocating for those stations to be closed, but rather that they be leveraged to barge over organic waste to Rikers, where we could construct a facility capable of processing up to a third of New York City's organic waste. A main focus of the plan is advocating that the new infrastructure benefit communities that have been impacted by incarceration and by this noxious infrastructure. As Rikers is built on a landfill, I wonder if your campaign has targeted landfill sites that actively house prisons. W was that all, was that supposed to be switching back to the other speaker? I'm confused now. Okay, so on this island that is 400 acres, all right, 400 acres, you want to build uh, energy storage capacity. You want to build one giant sewer treatment plant to take over for four individual treatment plants. And you want to have composting facilities to compost a third of New York's organic waste. And everything that's needed to do this on the island will have to be boated there back and forth, including people that work there and so on, in perpetuity. And the communities surrounding this thing are going to benefit how? Because the state's paying for it. I mean, benefit it in the sense that it's going to be a cleaner situation? I'm still, I'm still not sure I understand. Uh, okay, Jordan, back to the other speaker. We haven't launched campaigns to shut down existing prisons and jails built on landfills, but we have so far managed to prevent... Wait a second. Or, or is she throwing a question back at the other guy? Is that it? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll imagine that. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand the, the layout of this conversation. As Rikers is built on a landfill, I wonder if your campaign has targeted landfill sites that actively house prisons. We haven't launched campaigns to shut down existing prisons and jails. Aren't you a prison abolitionist? Uh, built on landfills. Okay, but we have so far managed to prevent $4.6 billion worth of new prison construction in Appalachia alone. Wow, okay. And here's the thing. It's a lot easier to stop new construction of prisons than it is to shut down existing ones, you don't say. However, we know that about a third of sites deemed highly contaminated by the Environmental Protection Agency, what they call Superfund sites, have a jail, prison, or detention center within five kilometers of them. Five kilometers? Okay. Part of what we do is amplify the voices of incarcerated people who are talking about the real, visceral experience of living with all the environmental toxins that come from these sites. Okay. Andrea, how does coalition building help reconceptualize land use in these rural areas where there are not a lot of employment options? What? <laughs> uh, part of what, okay, back to the other guy. Part of what we've done in a number of these coalition spaces over the years is one, really question the underlying assumption that prison and jail construction is good for the economy. Uh, it, it's good for keeping people that would break the law away from law abiding citizens. Have you guys considered that part of the, the equation yet? Uh, a study by professors from Appalachian State University looked at the economic impact of new prison and jail construction on local communities in Appalachia. Although hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on these projects, they found that prisons aren't driving economic growth there. Um, th they're not there for economic growth. They're there for incarceration. I mean, sure, they might provide some jobs, but we're not talking like a prison is an Amazon.com or something coming to set a headquarters in your town. Uh, okay, what we want is to reappropriate the money to the things that we know communities need. Are, are prisons an, uh, not a necessity? All right, in our original campaign to stop the construction of a prison in Kentucky's Letcher County, bad name for a county, community members asked local folks what else they would do with the $444 million the government was spending on the prison. Uh, swimming pools for everyone. People spoke about investing in small business grant infrastructure, reclaiming coal ash dumps and mountaintop removal sites, creating jobs, 
and improving farming. Uh-huh. Originally, our movement worked. Our movement work focused a lot on trying to shut prisons down, but now we're working on building coalitions that are capable of looking at what we could build as well. Okay, uh, now a question for you. Uh, in terms of the work y'all have been doing around Rikers, I'm curious about, I'm curious how you've experienced dealing with the city and any folks who are a part of the carceral administration. <laughs> The carceral administration. I noticed, for example, that the committee responsible for advancing recommendations for Rikers missed three of its four annual meetings that were mandated in 2022. Okay. Uh, Andrea, I think there's some momentum that's continuing and some that's being stilted as well. They're moving ahead with the part of the plan to close Rikers that will see four borough-based jails constructed to replace the Rikers Island Jail. The city is required to provide more humane conditions and situate the facilities closer to people's families. I don't know how you accommodate that exactly. Uh, but the city is also required to decrease the current number of people who are incarcerated on Rikers, which has stalled. The city is required to decrease the current number of people who are incarcerated on Rikers. So you have to ship them to other prisons then, I'm assuming. Uh, there are more promising steps with the feasibility studies regarding the plans for the island once the jail has been closed that look at the wastewater treatment plants and the renewable energy proposals. You didn't mention renewable energy. You mentioned storage facilities. That's a storing energy, but okay. I'm not personally engaging with the city on those matters. Why not? Aren't you in charge of... Okay, I've been more behind the scenes working on the design but Freedom Agenda is one of the main organizations doing lots of advocacy and holding the city to account. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there because that's about three quarters of the way through the, or just over halfway, sorry, pardon me, halfway through the article, and I'm not sure I'm going to get much more out of that. So I'm going to move on, moveon.org, to a uh, different article because that's just how I am right now. My attention span only goes so long. Uh, sure. All right, so let's move on to an article from, yes, Solutions Journalism. Yes. Uh, now, this is from November of 2022, so it's not quite current year. I thought maybe it was updated recently. I tried to look for articles that have been published within the last month or so, and this one came up, but maybe I misclicked somewhere. Uh, but before I get to that, Advocatus Diaboli, oh yeah, let's put the prisons right next to the school so they can see their kids. How could that go wrong? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Scanner Daffley, uh, whoops, Scanner Daffley, uh, or just give them a subway pass. Yeah, you have to locate the prisons nearer to the families. I mean, if I commit a crime in New York City or in a particular borough, I, I don't think it's up to the city to make sure I'm within walking distance of my family. I guess. I, I don't know how that's supposed to work. Uh, Shadow Claw. Scribe like these people don't create. They just attack and destroy. They have no clue what it takes to build something. Well, it, uh, I, I from their descriptions, I don't quite understand how if their main concern is the environmental impact of what's going on at the island or in the vicinity of the island, how simply moving and consolidating all the bad stuff to the island is then going to make everything better or how you get a green energy solution from simple storage. That one, that's the one that baffles me the most. Like you're going to shut down power plants and build storage sites. Storing what from where anyway. All right. From yes. Solutions journalism. What do we do while waiting to realize prison abolition? I'm not sure. What is the most productive thing to do while waiting for the 12th of never? Let's find out. Oh, pop up. All right. What was your worst relationship like? Uh, well, under what context? You're talking romantic? You're talking business? You're talking, you know, otherwise platonic? I don't know. Mine cost me over $55,000 and taught me important lessons about what it means to be an abolitionist in today's society. Okay, now I'm intrigued because I'm not quite sure how those different facts come together into a story. 
Dre, not his real name, was largely raised by his grandparents as his mother was struggling with substance use issues and his father was incarcerated. Okay. At the age of 12, he was expelled from school after leading friends to steal from other students during gym class. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that would do it. What happens to children when educators gifted with the responsibility to care for them call police and expel them from their learning community? Um, I hate to tell you this. Before we've even really begun your story, you're already starting with a very bad premise. Uh, educators are not daycare attendants. Educators are not parents. Okay. Now, this kid obviously had a very unfair start in life. His parents were irresponsible and not good at parenting. Uh, it's difficult to fault the grandparents because they probably didn't expect having to raise another child. But all the same, it wasn't the educator's responsibility to see to this kid's upbringing. <sighs> The responsibility to care for them, call police and expel them from their learning community. Well, if that kid and his little gang was beating up or shaking down other students, that's called juvenile crime. Those children don't cease to exist. Well, neither do the ones that were being stolen from, by the way. They are sent somewhere. And like the African proverb, quote, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth, unquote. The anger, humiliation, and hurt from being alienated goes with them. Oh, we're talking about the school to prison pipeline of some kind here? Okay, well, what would you have done instead? In Dre's case, months after being expelled at just 13 years old, he spent a year in juvenile detention for attempted murder after stabbing another child several times during a fight. Soon after his release, he joined a gang and started selling drugs. Well, it sounds like he was already part of a gang before he went to juvie. But okay. I met Dre when we were both 19. I, a young black woman at a predominantly white college, preferred hanging out with him and his friends to the frat kids on campus. <laughs> uh, implies quite a bit there, but moving on. As I went on to law school and into the criminal legal system, here we go again, the criminal legal system, not the criminal justice system, but the criminal legal system reform space. Okay, that's, can you get a degree in criminal legal system reform space? Uh, Dre cycled in and out of prison. Okay, so Dre, a full-grown adult, continued to make terrible, terrible decisions for himself. All right. I visited him in prison at times, but we inevitably lost touch over the years. As a society, we have chosen to invest billions of dollars in punishment an investment that often results in the mistaken assumption that the system, quote, holds people accountable, unquote, when it really does anything but. Okay, so who, who who's failed here, the system or Dre? One of the many unwritten goals of that system is to isolate people from their com Wait a second. One of the many unwritten goals of that system, you mean the system that puts people who've committed crimes in jail? Uh-huh of that system is to isolate people from their community. Yes, because they have victimized their community in some way, shape or form that is not tolerated by the community at large. That's why it's called incarceration. Making it even harder for them to avoid the psychological damage that comes with the violence and inhumanity endemic to the concrete and metal institutions we've erected to keep good, quote unquote, people safe, quote unquote. Oh, so the people that were victimized by Dre are not good people? I mean, as compared to him who tried to kill a kid and then went on to join a gang and sell drugs and God knows what else? Okay, not a strong start. Next section, what's the point of police if they can't keep us safe? I don't know. Let's just get rid of police. Then we'll all be equally safe, quote unquote. Uh, in summer 2020, summer 2020, was that, was that the summer of love? I received a call from a random number. 
I almost didn't answer, but when I did, I recognized the all too familiar, you have a call from blank, an inmate at dot, dot, dot. It was Dre. All right. That phone call restarted our relationship. We began talking daily. That fall, the day after he was released, I drove down to see him. He was on parole for nine months in the South while I was living in Maryland at the time. On parole for nine months? What happens after nine months? Uh, I allowed Dre to lease a vehicle in my name because he needed a mode of transportation. That's a roll of the dice. Next, to help him escape a racist parole officer who was intent on sending him back to prison, if you say so, I got him an apartment in a nearby county, also in my name. Uh, the roulette wheel keeps spinning. Then, of course, he needed a legal way to make a living. I let him lease a cargo van in my name so he could start a moving company, hooked him up with a friend willing to hire him for a temporary remote job, and loaned him money. Okay. Sure, some of these were reckless decisions on... <laughs> Some, some being all, but okay. All right. Man, I, I, I had not expected this in my prison abolition look today. I, I did not expect this. Sure, some of these were reckless decision, decisions on my part, but sometimes we do the wrong things for what we assume are the right reasons, i.e. love and a sense of obligation. Plus, he promised to return the loan <laughs> and make the monthly payments on the apartment and two cars. I trusted him. Let me guess. It was the educator's fault. Whatever is, I haven't read the next paragraph. I'm actually averting my eyes from the screen for a moment so I can be totally surprised. It, 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 it was the system that did what happened next. It was the educators. It was the endemic toxicity of the concrete and steel institutions that did this. It was the, uh, the, the boy he almost killed when he was 13 that did this. Two months after his release, Dre's grandmother, the woman who raised him, passed away. He spiraled into depression, doing drugs, sleeping all day, and taking his anger out on me. I was lucky if I could go five minutes without him calling me a stupid bitch, unquote, telling me I was nothing, unquote, and that I would, quote, die alone because no one else would want me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I, I'm not laughing at grandma passing away. Grandma probably did her best under the circumstances, but holy cats. You opened the door. Your pain was self-chosen here. At times, he would go so far as to say things like, quote, if I get you pregnant and you kill my baby, I'll beat you to death. <laughs> Jesus. Unquote. When I found out that he had been cheating pervasively, he blamed it on me. Wait, you were having a romantic relationship with this guy? Wait, wait, wait a second. I, I must have missed that part. Okay, not with notwithstanding personal responsibility. <laughs> notwithstanding personal responsibility, mental illness is real, yet we have made it easier to access a gun than to access trauma informed, culturally appropriate mental health support. This is amplified by the fact that faced with the PTSD inducing daily stressors of being black in America, few of us have learned how to identify when we need help. All right, so before you've even gotten into the results of your grand gesture of love and obligation, you're making excuses for this guy. I mean, it sounds like you've been making excuses for this guy from the get-go. But it's it's the system's fault. Notwithstanding personal responsibility, 
it's everything else but personal responsibility. And here I thought I was going to be talking about prison abolition. Dre eventually, <laughs> good Lord, Dre eventually blew off the job I got him and wasn't doing anything to start a business with the van. A, oh my gosh, a voodooist who had become a father figure to Dre convinced him he was going to be a famous rapper one day. In the interim, he returned to selling drugs and took up scamming, namely in the form of credit card and unemployment fraud. Unsuccessful in his criminal pursuits, he didn't make enough money, and I was stuck paying his bills of roughly $2,500 a month in addition to mine for the better part of a year. I spent even more money, including taking a sizable early withdrawal from my retirement account to get the two vehicles and apartment out of my name. The verbal abuse and financial strain became so stressful, I often woke up in the middle of the night in a panic. What am I reading? Okay, one night, Dre went through my phone and came across a conversation where I expressed to a friend how overwhelmed I felt by him leaning on me for everything. He threw my phone at me, and when that wasn't enough, followed me into my bedroom. He stood over me yelling as I sat on my bed. He wrestled me to the ground to get my phone from me and then destroyed it, leaving pieces of plastic and glass scattered across the floor. He finally calmed down enough to step out onto the balcony to smoke a cigarette, but when he came back in, he stood between me and the front door, the only exit from my 11th floor condo, and told me, lit cigarette in hand, that he was going to, quote, kill me and my dog, unquote. He had previously described how he had killed people, so this didn't feel like an empty threat. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. It was three police officers. Good that's apparently my neighbors below me had overheard the altercation and called 911. I told the police I was okay. I wasn't. I didn't, however, want to feed another black man into the criminal legal system as I knew his reincarceration would only compound his trauma while failing to solve his issues in the long term. What? What is that? What the fuck is that? I tried explaining my dilemma to one of the officers, also a black man. He told me I could file a restraining order. I responded that, as an attorney, I knew a restraining order wouldn't keep me safe. But it puts a condition on his contacting you, doesn't it? To my surprise, he nodded resign res resignedly, resignedly. What's the point of police if they can respond to harm, often in even more harmful ways, but are not capable of protecting us? Well, I'll tell you what, lady. What if, and I'm just a theory here, just a theory. What if uh, you sent this guy to prison and he was unable to victimize other people you haven't even met yet? Would you have been able to protect other people from impending problems? Also, if you don't file a restraining order, then the cops are effectively powerless to try to defend you if something goes wrong. But we un unfortunately, we don't live in Minority Report, and we don't have a department of pre-crime. We can try to uh, disincentivize crime. We can react to crime when it happens. And citizens who are part of this society, because it's not just up to cops, like the people who called 911 to try to protect their neighbor from what they thought was a threat. It takes everybody. It's not just the cops' responsibility for our collective safety. But yeah, just get rid of the cops. It's fine. One of the last weekends I saw Dre, he punched and choked his sister and beat her boyfriend with a tire iron for stealing from him. The next night, he was waiting outside my house with a knife to stab a member of my family. Imagine if you'd filed assault charges on him. 
or something earlier. I eventually managed to remove myself from Dre financially and physically. Still, the year I spent with him broke me down in ways I'm still unpacking. In quiet moments, I sit with myself, reflecting on the strength I didn't know I had. No, it sounds more like cowardice to me. Whatever. And the community I didn't know I so desperately needed to get through it all. I have... I am honestly just dumbfounded. First, that I thought I was going to be reading an article about prison abolition, but that I read that, and that her conclusion in this all is that she's strong and did the right thing when she could have headed off those future crimes he committed or attempted crimes he was planning to do at the pass by pressing charges. Embracing abolitionism. Some have insisted Dre belongs back in jail. <laughs> are, are some the majority of rational thinking people? Okay. But as an attorney who has dedicated my career to dismantling the criminal legal system, uh huh. I have spent inordinate amounts of time in prisons and jails across the country, heartbroken while bearing witness to the realities of centuries of racism. He attempted to kill you. He attempted to kill a member of your own family. He attempted to kill his own sister. And, and then beat her boyfriend. And Okay. I identify as an abolitionist. Uh-huh. Because I know incarceration does not equal safety. So Dre is better off, and we are all better off with Dre on the street. All right, well, how Okay. In the absence of incarceration, how would you solve for the problem that is Dre? What how would you solve for Dre? Abolition is not as reductionist as firing all police and closing every prison tomorrow. You call yourself an abolitionist. What does it mean to abolish something? You want a slow phasing out of police and prisons. Okay, fine. You are a tortoise abolitionist. How would that work? As writer Rachel Kushner summarized in an article about abolition in the New York Times, quote, instead of asking how in a future without prisons, we will deal with so-called violent people. Oh, yeah. No, it's just an abstract theory. There, I mean, there aren't really violent people. They're just so-called, you know, a guy who would try to choke out his own sister and beat her boyfriend with a tire iron and wait outside my apartment with a knife and threaten to kill a member of my family and deal drugs and stab a 13-year-old almost to death when he was in juvie. Yeah, you're just so-called. I mean, it's really just kind of a, you know, it's just an abstract. <sighs> Instead of asking how, in a future without prisons, we will deal with so-called violent people, abolitionists ask how we will ask how we resolve inequalities and get people the resources they need long before the hypothetical moment when they mess up, quote unquote. Okay, well, uh, you know what? I have an active example of this. I, I, I have a I have a very, I mean, a very on point active example of. That, okay. So what you do is you take a guy who has spent the better part of his entire life committing crimes, victimizing people in and out of, you know, incarceration institutions, one or the other. And then you hand him, hand him every conceivable tool and opportunity possible to change his life. You buy him a car, you buy him a van, you buy him a place to stay, you put it all in your name. He's under no obligation. He's got nothing hanging over him. He's got everything going from you have given him the resources he needs before the, the hypothetical, I mean, it's hypothetical, moment that they you know, mess up. And, and, you know, we see what happens. So obviously that's the solution. 
right? You take somebody, give them all the chance in the world, and then what decision do they make? And who's on the hook for it? Who ends up suffering as a result of it? Now, that's right, everybody else. Leading abolitionists Ruth Wilson Gilmore and James Kilgore, Gilmore and Kilgore, uh, corroborated this in a commentary for The Marshall Project, saying, quote, locking people up does not provide adequate housing, proper mental health treatment, or living wage jobs, unquote. Uh, okay. Many of the support systems that would help make abolition a reality are the same ones that would have met Dre's needs and made him less likely to cause the harm he did. You signed over your life to this guy. You gave him a blank check to change his life. And he decided that it wasn't worth his time. And then terrorized you and everybody around him. And you can't blame that on his grandmother passing away. That is weak sauce. This guy did not want to change. This guy took advantage of you, and you were more than happy to be taken advantage of. What, so ha, what I don't understand is, how does our author give us that long and detailed accounting of her own experience with this guy? And even though it is anecdotal, all the same, it is her example. And then come back and say, well, what you need to do is change the way you treat people who have been criminalized, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you did that. You did that, I mean, to the moon. And, and yet you're still convinced that this is the way to go. <sighs> okay, let's try that again. Many of the support systems that would help make abolition a reality are the same ones that would have met Dre's needs and made him less likely to cause the harm, it's the kind of harm he did. Less likely than what? 100%? But those supports were not and are still not there for him and others like him. Lady, what are you talking about? You bought this guy a brand new life. You bought him a brand new start. You bought him an opportunity that few people in this world ever get. And he just pissed it all away and then made you his emotional punching bag, if not literal, and then went on to make other people his punching bags in the process. And you got you got footed with the bill. What? You know, I, I, have, I have a certain amount of sympathy for our author because she's living in a delusionary state, seems like. So as abolitionists, how do we operate in the world we have today? I don't know. How do you? It's easy to speak theoretically about not calling the police while dreaming of a society where everyone has access to the resources they need to thrive. Yeah, it is easy to speak theoretically because you gave him all the resources he needed to thrive and somebody else had to call the police to try to save you. I mean, I... I shudder to think what would have happened if your neighbors had not called the cops that night. But what happens when we find ourselves living in the world as it is, confronted by harm or inviting harm into your home and told the only solutions available to us are the ones birthed by white supremacy, i.e. police, prosecutors, and prisons? Do we give in and turn to systems we don't believe in because we're told they're all we have? Or do we resign ourselves to suffering in silence? I think there's another way. Okay, well, you had both avenues open to you. You gave this guy everything, and you ended up being in danger. The cops show up, hopefully, I think, may have mitigated the possibility of him endangering you further, and... Okay. Among other things, white super oh lord, among other things white supremacy feeds off the myth of individualism. The myth of individualism. As abolitionists, we must therefore be rooted in community. Huh, I, I wonder what happens if you take the the root of community and and smash it up against 
individualism. Huh. I, I, I wonder. I wonder. So what can that look like today as we continue to take collective steps towards realizing a healthier world? My relationship with Dre taught me three things to help answer this question. All right. Here we go, guys. These are the lessons learned. I, 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 am, I am enthralled by this article. First, we should all have safety plans before harm happens. Oh, you mean like having 911 on speed dial? Or a gun? Or an aluminum bat or something? Like what? This means connecting with our family, friends, and other community members to be clear about who can provide what type of support so we know who to call if and when something goes wrong. Okay, well, then in your situation, when Dre was threatening to kill you and your dog, who would you call to take care of Dre? Would it be the family member he was threatening to kill later on? Would it be his own family members that he was almost killing earlier? Who would you call? Who would you trust to stop Dre from harming you? Relatedly, we need to be there intentionally for one another because, as Alex Mingus declared, quote, police don't keep us safe, we keep us safe, unquote. Yes, when your neighbors called the authorities to help protect you. Again, law enforcement and crime reduction and mitigation is not a police all by themselves situation. It really takes a community watching out for each other like your neighbors did for you. And they knew they couldn't help you by themselves, so they called people who were trained and equipped to do so. Okay, uh, thank you, Kieverdam. Here's the link for anyone who might want it. Uh, Atmos, uh, 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 blah, blah, blah. Atmos Earth Prison Abolition Rikers Island. Yeah, links to all the articles, guys, are in the, um, are in the description uh, to each one of the articles that I picked out. I might not end up reading them all, but all the links are there for the ones that I had picked out for this. So, um, but thank you, Kieverdam. Yeah, anybody interested in this stuff, uh, there's there's links in the description. <sighs> okay. Learning how and when to intervene in violent situations can take time. Well, how much time should we allow someone who is violent to commit violence on somebody else before we feel ready to intervene? Or would you rather have people who are trained and equipped to intervene in such violent situations ahead of time. So there's no dilly dallying or dithering about about it. Learning how and when to intervene in violent situations can take time, but we can start by creating radically safe, non judgmental spaces for people to just be. Oh, you mean like the apartment you bought that guy and the two cars and the business that you tried to help him start up? you know, where you weren't judging him on his past actions, but giving him absolutely every tool possible to start a new life. And he, he threatened to kill you and tried to kill others in the process. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes all we need is a place where we can finally stop holding our breath. The people who created safe spaces for me were unknowingly teaching me how to ask for help. Okay. Then who did you not call when he was threatening to kill you? Who did you decide not to ask for help when you had a violent criminal in your house standing over you and threatening your life? Why did it take your neighbors who were keeping their ears open for their neighbors before help came? And when I did, my request was often met with ready willingness, no questions asked. All right, well, who would you have put in harm's way to deal with Dre that night? Or any night? I needed that as questions about why I remained involved with a person as traumatized as Dre would have made me retreat further into myself. It is a legitimate question. Why would you remain involved with somebody who is going to kill you by their own declaration? What possible sense did that make? 
You already admitted that your decisions were reckless. So is the problem Dre here or was it you? Finally, we have to stop falling into the trap of cancel culture. Cancel culture? People like Dre aren't born abusive. They come to be over time as they are pushed out from their communities. So it's not Dre's fault. Okay, well, then who shall we blame for the tire iron beating, for the stabbing, for the choking, for the drug dealing, for the theft? Who shall we blame? What shall we do to stop this? It's not Dre, obviously. He's just a marionette. He's being pulled by invisible strings of cancel culture. We have to let go of the myth that banishing people engaging in harmful behavior makes us safer. The myth that banishing people engaging in harmful... Yes, okay, well, so, you know, just as an example, Ted Bundy. Well, obviously, putting him in jail didn't really solve anything. It, it didn't prevent anybody else from being harmed. Obviously, Ted Bundy just needed a pat on the head and a warm glass of milk, and he'd been fine. Yeah, you know. Relocating harm is not the same as addressing it. No, no, no. It's not about relocating. Not about relocating. It's about isolating. Isolating people who would commit harm to others. It comes down to personal choice at a certain stage of the game. Dre could have had a completely different life. You handed him everything he needed to do so for free in your own name. No obligation, nothing hanging over his head. You took on his future debt to become a better member of society. And he slapped it away and then beat it half to death with a crowbar. As Adrienne Marie Brown uh, I'm going to guess here. Is Adrienne Marie Brown one of the people who uh, protest by not putting any capital letters in their name? And and I'm not kidding. That is a thing. I did a whole video on it. I can't remember the title of it. But yeah, that is, that is a movement of a, of a kind. As Adrienne Marie Brown so beautifully explained, quote, canceling is punishment and punishment doesn't stop the cycle of harm. Instead of prison bars, we place each other in an overflowing box of untouchables and strip us of the complexity of being gifted and troubled, brilliant and broken, unquote. What are you talking about? She insists we, quote, set down this punitive measure and pick each other up, leaving no traumatized person behind. Okay, our author did that, and look what happened to her. We belong to, this is back to the author, we belong to each other. Uh, no. And with that belonging comes an obligation to care for one another as we would ourselves. Yes. To a certain extent, yes. As a community, your neighbors called the cops when you wouldn't. That guy was not just a threat to you at that point. If he was standing outside of your apartment with a knife shortly thereafter, threatening a member of your family, he's not just your problem. And they didn't see your problem as just your problem. They tried to help. And you just like, no, the police can't do anything to help me. There's something beautiful and healing about taking a deeply painful experience and reframing it spinning it you mean as an opportunity to understand what it really means to be in community and to do abolition not just talk about it ultimately it was my community's many acts of abolition that saved me and that will change the world and that is worth much more than fifty five thousand dollars $55,000 that could have gone to a college scholarship. If you're going to just burn money, you might as well have burned money on something worthwhile. Instead, you burn it on a career criminal who then took you to the cleaners under your own name, and then you try to spin that story into, what, an example of success? 
or to try to justify it in your own mind that, well, my intentions were good. Yeah, your intentions were good. And what is the road to hell paved with? Holy cats, man. That's just something else. Uh, yeah. Uh, random American. So can we sign up to do abolition, abolitionists? 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 I, I guess. Can you do abolition? I don't know. Uh, Scandard Affley, you know what is really scary? These lunatics have the ear of politicians. We find ourselves on the brink because of people like this and their refusal to accept reality. I have absolutely no problem with trying to find a way to ease uh, convicted criminals back into society in productive ways. None at all. Like jobs, programs, training, transition centers, things like that. In concept and in practice, I, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, but it has to be, you know, undertaken by professionals and it has to have uh, consequences and incentives that phase someone back into society. Because it doesn't make any sense to me. It honestly doesn't. That if somebody serves their time, that they shouldn't then be given at least a fair chance to reenter society as a productive individual. It just makes sense to me. Some people cannot be helped. But people should be given the opportunity to prove everybody else wrong and as well prove themselves wrong about what they might think of their own uh, capabilities. I have no problem with that. In theory, what this lady did was everything you could possibly want as a quote-unquote abolitionist, reformer, etc. She gave this guy a blank check. And yet after the fact, she's still making excuses for him. After he made her a victim... I mean, she victimized herself. She set herself up for a problem by not putting any kind of incentive on his part or putting him at, on the hook for any of it. She set herself up. But the, the moment that she becomes a victim, it's still somebody else's fault. It's not his fault, and it's not her fault for enabling him. It's somebody else's fault. Yeah, no, that's, 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 not how, that's not what's going to save people from being, becoming criminals or save everybody else around us from having to suffer crime. I, I don't know what lesson she thought she was teaching us there, but that was, that was unexpected. <laughs> that was unexpected. Uh, okay. I'm going to do one more. I know I have four links on there, but this, that one went a lot longer than I thought it would. These two combined man alive. So we're going to go to something that I think, I think is more on point. I think, I hope. But I mean, if it's another amazing drama story, I'll I'll take that. I'll take that. Uh, let's see. Oh, who do we have? we have here? Let's like wait a second. Is there a Tim? There's a Tim. It is it is Tim. Some call me Tim. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I mean there is more than one Tim out there. This may be Tim from the Dave's Lemonade Discord, uh, along with Miranda Stone, Queen of the Dave's Lemonade Discord. Uh, but, uh, all right. What is the case? Wait. No. <laughs> the Harvard Gazette. The Harvard Gazette. What is case for prison abolition? Did, did Borat write the headline for this? <laughs> Oh, man. How do I pick these things? Tommy Selby, oh, sorry, Shelby, examines history arguments, history comma arguments in new book, arrives at nuanced response. All right. What is case for prison abolition? Tommy Shelby, who has dedicated his career to thinking about questions regarding race, black political thought, and social theory, was intrigued by the prison abolition movement of recent decades and wondered whether he should be a part of it. Or sorry, be part of it. Sorry, let, me, let me zoom in on this a bit. Sorry. I, every time I change tabs, it uh, de-zooms the text. But the Caldwell Titcom Professor of African and of African and African-American studies. Uh, well, okay, let me try that again. 
but the Caldwell Titcomb Professor of African and African American Studies and of Philosophy, that's a lot of letters after, the, after your name, was bothered by the sense that he didn't have a firm grasp on its underpinnings, okay? So he set himself to the task of working through the major arguments in favor of abolition, including incarceration's ties to slavery, racism in the prison system, various inequities in the justice system itself, and the prison industrial complex, and chronicled that journey in his new book, The Idea of Prison Abolition. Okay, quote, I'm a philosopher only by training, but that's how I see my role in the intellectual world. Most of my work is an attempt to philosophically reflect on various aspects of black life, unquote, Shelby said. He noted that he isn't an activist advocating for a specific cause, but quote, a person interested and curious about the movement and its ideas, excuse me, who wants to critically reflect on their main arguments and to decide whether I should be a part of it, unquote. Well, then he and I are cut from a similar cloth because that's almost exactly why I read these things and have looked at these, at, at these uh, items over the years. What is the argument? Whether I agree with it or not, I'd like to understand the argument. I've heard several. Let's see what he has to say. Ultimately, the self-described defender of radical reform... Wait a sec. He noted that he isn't an activist advocating for a specific cause. The self-described defender of radical reform. Okay, arrived at a more nuanced conclusion that both prison reformers who seek to improve the system and abolitionists who call for ending it and adopting alternatives should share a common goal. Quote, to fundamentally change the social conditions that so often give rise to the need for punitive incarceration, unquote. Uh, the, social condition, the social conditions are called human beings. Uh, we, we, we don't have laws because we don't understand that humans are flawed creatures. We have laws because we very much understand that people have a tendency to do terrible things to each other, and we need to have consequences for those terrible things being done. That's the social conditions is called the human condition. I don't know how you're going to fundamentally change the human condition. It's been attempted before. <laughs> it doesn't quite work out too well. A starting place for Shelby was the life and writings of renowned academic and activist Angela Davis, one of the founders of the movement. Oh, Angela Davis, who's descended from people from the Mayflower. Is, was that Angela Davis? Have you guys seen that video? It is hilarious where she finds out her ancestry. Oh, man, it's great. Quote, I wanted to think about her early engagement with the prison and the political context that came from. And that was a context of participating in a left wing black power way of engaging with issues of race and class, Shelby said. Yeah, Angela Davis. Yeah. Black Panther and connected to several serious crimes. All right. Many of Davis's early engagements with prison abolition dealt with freeing individuals she considered political prisoners in the 1960s and 70s, people she believed had been caught up in the criminal justice system. Oh, not the criminal legal system? Wow, okay. Often under false pretenses to undermine the Black Revolutionary Movement. Yeah, the Black Panthers were just angels all around. Uh, Shelby was inspired by Davis's writings from the 1970s, as well as, though, as, as well as those of political activist and writer Asada Shakur, a former member of the Black Panthers and Black Liberation Army who likened life in a disadvantaged or ghetto neighborhood to that in a minimum security prison. There is often a flow between these disadvantaged communities to prison and back, Shelby noted. Shelby, stud Shelby studied several other Black radicals of the time, including Huey Newton, to further his exploration into political prisoners. You know, he's picking an awfully specific uh, set of individuals in his studies. Seems a bit narrow, but okay. Newton regarded himself as such and wrote extensively about his time being incarcerated. In his book, Revol Revolutionary Suicide, the Black Panther Party founder examined the similarities between enslavement and imprisonment, including the lack of freedom of movement, total power by prison authorities, and constant surveillance. It's not a day spa. It's prison. Shelby then applied those arguments about political prisoners to residents of these neighborhoods and proposed a third type of political prisoner, 
the rebellious resident. Okay, quote, those who refuse to participate in the in the licit economy. In the licit economy. Okay, well, there, there's two words that I haven't, I'm not familiar with off the top of my head. Latine from the first article and now licit. Licit economy on the grounds that to do so would be degrading or exploitative, often have great difficulty raising sufficient funds to move to better neighborhoods, particularly if they abstain from preying on other disadvantaged members of their community, Shelby wrote. Their unwillingness to accept whatever jobs are available is punished with an impoverished and segregated existence. In the licit... Okay, all right. What is the... What is the What is an what is an, not an illicit? What, okay, so it's just legal. What? Wait. Hold on. Illicit, forbidden by law, rules, or custom. So those who refuse to participate in the legal economy, on the grounds that to do so would be degrading or exploitative often have great difficulty raising sufficient funds to move to but yeah i guess if you don't take a, a, a honest job if you make a, a statement by not taking an honest job to get money because you see it as degrading you you're not going to have funds to what Okay. Their unwillingness to accept whatever jobs are available is punished with an impoverished and segregated existence. Yes, if you do not work and you have no income and you refuse to take jobs that are available nearby to you, then yes, you will have many economic problems. Shelby also explored Davis's steadfast belief that slavery continues to live on in contemporary institutions, both in prison and in the death penalty. Uh huh. Following her own incarceration at Marin County Jail in connection with her alleged involvement in a deadly courthouse escape, uh huh. Davis has argued that prisons in the U.S. are dehumanizing and linked to the practice of slavery, quote, in ways that make imprisonment deeply objectionable and particularly intolerable for African Americans, Shelby wrote. Shelby said there may be points of comparison between the institution of slavery and that of imprisonment, but that they are not the same thing, and the issues are thorny and fraught. Okay, well, fair enough. He noted that many question labor practices within the context of incarceration, including whether individuals who are imprisoned should work, how much they should get paid if they are required to work, and who benefits from that labor. Those questions are further complicated when one includes community service as a form of punishment, Shelby said. Yes, well, it's it's a form of restitution to the community. You know, it's it's a kind of, you know, physical reparation. In the absence of being able to pay money, you have to give your labor. So, I mean, it's either fines or community service, you know, money or trade. Uh, Shelby said he does not consider himself a radical abolitionist. Well, you seem to focus the entirety of your studies on such, but okay. Though there is plenty to be learned from them. Quote, I do think prisons under certain circumstances can be a, social, a socially necessary and morally justified way of responding to harmful wrongdoing, he said. Okay. Quote, but I think that abolitionists are right that we should aspire to not rely so heavily on the practice of imprisonment and ideally not rely on it at all, unquote. Okay, well, not relying it at, on it at all, never going to work. So what you are is actually a pro-reform. And abolitionists are wrong because we come back to that whole abolish thing again. You can't abolish prisons. Reforming them, sure, depending on what we're talking about. Abolishing them outright, no. He hopes the book helps others who are still trying to decide whether they support prison abolition over criminal justice reform. I, well, I, I don't have to decide because so far I haven't seen any kind of argument for abolition that makes any sense to me logically. Uh, and our last article 
kind of, at least anecdotally, prove the point. Quote, I'm hoping people approach the question in as much the same way I did when I was working on it. Wait, when I was on working... <sighs> I read it as it's written. The same way I did when I was on working on it, which is to take seriously abolitionist objections to the practice of imprisonment, even if they ultimately don't agree, Shelby said. Yes, that is what I have attempted to do. Uh, and I've looked at any number of different people making different arguments or coming at it from different angles because no one argument represents all arguments. But thus far, even in their own examples, and really that, <laughs> so aside from, aside from the lady giving us her chapter by chapter recitation of giving a career criminal a, a, blank check to change his life and suddenly not that was that was probably the best i, I mean I, I couldn't ask for anything more as far as just blowing my mind but this passage right here i'm going to read it one more time just so we have it clear quote those who refuse to participate in the legal i'm going to put that in their economy on the grounds that to do so would be degrading or exploitative often have great difficulty raising sufficient funds to move to better neighborhoods particularly if they abstain from preying on other disadvantaged members of their community their unwillingness to accept whatever jobs are available is punished quote unquote with an impoverished and segregated existence I, I, I don't know what else to say to that. That is just, uh, it is, except for the part where preying on other disadvantaged members of their community. Okay, well, if they're not working legally, if they're making any income then, then it must be illegal. And if it's illegal, then you are in some way, shape, or form preying on other members of the community, disadvantaged or otherwise. So how is not participating in a legal occupation preying on disadvantaged people in the community more than participating in an illegal occupation? I, what? I don't know. That's, that's quite the mind bender right there. Dr. Mindbender. <sighs> this I command. Anyway, there's some... References for you 80s kids. Uh, Jamie Man Jam, I saw a woman with two kids in tow wearing a dirty shirt walk up to a salon and ask if they were hiring. When the front desk said no, she told her to sign an unemployment paperwork sheet. Wow. Okay. Jeez, Louise. Uh, Advocatus, uh, all of these abolitionists are tr justifying why we need to get rid of it, but making zero actual suggestions for what to do when we do, and that is a problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the question I've asked... Uh, at, at least rhetorically under just about every restorative justice video I've looked at or abolitionist article I've read or panel discussion I've, I've watched. What do you do with the Ted Bundy? What do you do with the Bernie Madoff? What do you do uh, with, I don't know, like uh, uh, the, the, the Willie Suttons of the world, right? You know, serial bank robbers, things like that. What do you do with someone who is just, pathological in their harming other people or stealing from other people, victimizing people in some way, shape or form. What do you do with Dre? You know, don't forget about Dre. Uh, did our, did our author ever say what should have happened to Dre? I mean, he had been in jail often, and then he had been handed the tools necessary to change his life and nothing helped. So what should happen? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Anybody else before I start wrapping things up? Uh, Empire, dropping a like because I want to cover you in cocoa butter and turn you over a low fire. Uh... What? What is that? The fuck is that? Oh! Well, I, that that might be a first. Maybe I don't, I don't know. I've ever ever done a WTF on a comment before. Not impossible, I suppose. Uh, all right. Well, everybody. <laughs> 
I'm going to call it there. I think that's an interesting place to leave off. Uh, a couple of programming notes. Uh, the next TED Excellence will be Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, where I'll take a look at another off-brand TED Talk for fun and enjoyment. I call it... Uh, now, you thought I was going to say fun joyment. No, no, enun. That's what I was going to say. Uh, also, there'll be another Sunday stream next Sunday at the regular time of 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, where we'll talk about a thing. Not sure yet. I'll decide that on a Saturday. And uh, another note, there is still, I, I have sent out some more, let's say, uh, I was about to say feelers, but given the last comment, that might be a little bit too uh, suggestive. I've sent out some more emails to other content creators in the true crime genre to try to see if I can organize a, another uh, Living on Borrowed Crime episode, in addition to the one that is oncoming at some point in the near future with Matt Orchard and Dave's Lemonade. Uh, the, the, the watch sign right now is as soon as Matt is done with his current project, he will be free to take a breather and participate in a Living on Borrowed Crime. So there's that. Also, uh, well, before I get to that, thank you, Miranda Stone, as always, both for your generosity and your support in being a moderator, uh, both on the show and on my Discord channel, which is a great segue to the fact that I have a Discord server. I say channel, server, I'm all very old school IRC, so pardon me. Now, if you'd like to join the Discord server, well, you can do that right about now if you're watching live or if you're able to pull up the live chat sometime in the relatively near future of the next 24 hours, because the link I've just put into the chat will take you to the landing channel, say hello, on the Scribelight Discord server. And what do you have to do on the say hello channel in order to join the Discord server? You have to say the secret word. And what is today's secret word? Today's secret word is licit. L-I-C-I-T. Licit. So if you're not already a member of the Scribelight Discord server, just go over there, say licit, we'll know that you watch the show, and then you'll become a member of the server. So there you go. But beyond that, everybody, thank you all so much for joining me. Let me know what you thought of the stream and the articles within in the comments below. Leave a like on your way out if you would. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Uh, tell your mother you love her. Uh, pet your dog. Do all the nice things in the world because it's Sunday. And it's the last day of the weekend before we get back into the grind that is the week ahead. And with that, I hope you all... Wait, let me stop. I almost screwed up. I usually have a great ending. But here we go. Not a happy ending. Could be. Uh, moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Even though everyone here is so well-behaved, you have very little to do. Everybody who donated, either to myself or to the fundraisers pinned to the top of the chat box, thank you guys so very much for your generosity. It is very, very much appreciated. Everyone else... I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. I hope your week is productive and fun. I hope you're all safe and well. If you are not well, please get well soon, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.